Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 1,336. Today on Cars Yeah, we're celebrating the 47th annual Forest Grove Concours that takes place on Sunday, July 21st on the campus of Pacific University in Forest Grove, Oregon. For more information, go to forestgroveconcours.org. Always question. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, automotive enthusiasts. I'm revved up and so excited to introduce today's very special guest. Calling in from across the pond in Berkshire, England, Martin Port. Hey, Martin, are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? I certainly am, Mark. All right. Martin Port has worked in the automotive publishing business for 18 years and is an author, an art editor, freelance writer, and photographer. He's the art editor for Classic and Sports Car Magazine, a magazine I've loved for many, many years writes and shoots photography for Classic Land Rover magazine, and is the editor for Built to Last magazine. Martin also writes for the Land Rover Series 2 Club magazine. His latest book, however, is what we'll be talking about mostly today. It's titled Mini Scrapbook, 60 Years of the British Icon, published by our friends at Porter Press International in the United Kingdom. By the way, this year marks the 60th anniversary of the Mini, a little car that made a big impact. This is the latest in a scrapbook series from Philip and Julie Porter at Porter Press. Martin also has worked as the art editor for Liverpool Football Club Match Day Magazine and the official McLaren F1 Team Magazine as well. You are one busy guy, Martin. I've told our listeners just a little bit about you. Would you take a brief moment before we jump into the questions and share a little bit more about your career and a very obvious passion that you have for automobiles. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I mean, that's uh, that's a pretty comprehensive introduction uh, itself, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I got a trained graphic designer who uh, ended up writing, um, I suppose I, I started off writing um, advertising copy due to a shortfall in a previous publishing company role that I had. And then uh, I got a little bit fed up. I was working on educational publishing material, and I got fed up of never never seeing anyone look at what I did. So I wanted to move to a, a consumer magazine environment where I could walk into a uh, a news agent or a book stand and see see what I'd done on the shelf. So I made a big leap and uh, went and worked for a large publishing company here in the UK and uh, worked for, as you correctly said, Liverpool Football Club magazine. Which So I went from not knowing if anyone saw what I was designing and writing and illustrating to sitting in uh, in a football stadium with 60,000 people or thereabouts, um, <laughs> all reading and looking at what I did. So, But you're correct, cars are my passion. They they have been since, um, well, since I learned to drive, um, particularly old cars. And so I did work for McLaren Formula One for, for a year and a half. That was a pretty stressful job, but, you know, an enjoyable arena and uh, and fulfilled my, I suppose, went to fulfill my interest in, in Formula One that I'd had since I was a, a boy before I went to the classic car world. And uh, yeah, classic and sports car, I've worked there for, oh, crikey, um, yeah, 16 years or something like that now. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, wow, it's amazing. Well, you did take a big leap. You and I have something in common, my friend. Uh, I studied graphic design and advertising in the first 11 years of my career. I worked as a creative director at an advertising agency, which then uh, led to working in a business and helping build that business where we mailed lots of catalogs. And so I did a lot of catalog design layout. And as us creative people always have placed on us, oh, you know how to do more than just that? Okay, here, do this, do this, do this. So (laughs) I ended up writing copy, taking photographs, layout design, uh, product selection, product development, even product design. So uh, yeah, got to be creative in my early years as well. So You're on a great track, my friend. Well, as we continue on your journey, I always like to start with a success quote or a mantra. This is some kind of saying that's been instrumental in forming your life and your success. It's a really nice way to get those inspirational tires turning here on Cars. Yeah. So Martin, I know you love to drive because you've driven a lot of cool things, which we're going to learn about. Take the wheel. Uh, Yeah. I mean, uh, one quote, I think, which I was introduced to ooh, quite a number of years ago now by somebody who I was building an engine with. Um, I owned a, a Porsche 912. It's a, a Californian import car, actually. And I built an engine with an extremely talented engine builder. And 
he instilled something in me which I always try and exercise now. And the, the quote was very, very simple. It was always question. Uh, and I didn't really understand what he meant at the start, but his genuine thought process was that no matter how many times something has been written down, whether it's instructions in a in a workshop manual or a specialist, you know, in a local garage or something telling you how something should be done or how it's been done for decades, it's not necessarily the best way. And it's not always the right way. And actually, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, if people didn't stop and question, then we wouldn't have so many developments in the world of technology or you know, modern medicine and all sorts of things, let alone just how to fix a car or put something together in the right way. So, yeah, I think that's a really good good um, you know, quote or mantra to, to have. You know, why it, what comes to mind is uh, my son was just recently visiting. He's an adult now and working and living in another city. But when he was little, he asked so many questions that sometimes you just wanted to go, ah, stop asking me questions. But, you know, little children are like that. They're not afraid to ask that question. And I think as we get older, sometimes, and maybe it's the school system that does it, sit in your desk and listen, don't talk. We kind of stop asking questions. Now, thankfully, there's schools these days that don't do that. Both my kids went to Montessori school where they definitely push questions and get up and move around and do things. You don't have to sit in a row and all that. I love that whole concept, and it's something I think everybody should do more often uh, in whatever aspect of their life. So I love it. Always question. Would you go back in time with me here and share a story that instigated that passion you have for cars? You talked about when you learned how to drive. That was something that kind of kicked it off. But is there a pivotal moment in your life when you knew that you indeed were going to be a car guy? Well, I think it was when I first decided that I was going against the grain, you know, compared to my peer group and and went down the route of classic car ownership. And that really did come about from learning how to drive and sitting. I remember the conversation sitting in my dad's back garden, thinking about what I'm going to buy as a first car. It wasn't that he was trying to get me to go and, and buy an old car. It was merely his stories of, I suppose, driving and, and maintaining what were then just you know, secondhand used cars, but were, by the time I was learning to drive, bona fide classics. Um, and I think that was what made me suddenly sit up and take notice that all my, all my friends were going out and buying you know, 500 pounds worth of uh, Ford Fiesta or something like that. I don't know what the equivalent would be in, uh, in the US, you know, a, I don't know, a, a Gremlin or a Pacer or something like that. Yeah, at the time. yeah. yeah. nothing um, too fancy, that's for yeah. sure. Yeah, but, you know, I set my heart suddenly on, on buying still nothing special but a Morris Minor, and it was, you know, very different to, um, to what everyone else was driving. And, and really and truly that set me on a path of, of wanting to drive something different compared to the yeah. majority of people. I think that's the case for car people. I think back to my high school days when I was driving, and I bought a Carmen Ghia, and most of the cars in the parking lot were either hand-me-down sedans or wagons, or for those few kids whose parents were well-heeled, as we say, they were driving new BMWs or something really nice. I remember a kid getting a Z28 Camaro that was pretty yeah, darn cool, good, yeah. <laughs> wishing I could get one of those, but... uh yeah, I think the for those of us who are car people, we kind of lean towards something unique and different and classic. For me, it was the Ghia because I loved Porsches but couldn't afford one, even a 912 back then. So that was my my poor man's Porsche. But uh, Morris Minor, not a car that you see over here in the U.S. hardly ever, but uh, a cool car nonetheless. Yeah, I mean, and, and in fact, it was partly down to my, my father again on that that single conversation that he was telling me about a Morris Minor that, that he used to own. Um, he always tells about having an Alexander Phase 3 conversion on the engine. I still never really fully understood what that was, but all he, he said was that it went like, insert expletive, off of a shovel. Um, <laughs> and um, and I think it was it was those stories of um, what dropping gearboxes out and changing clutches over a ditch by the side of the road and, you know, being on leave from the RAF, the Royal Air Force, and, and buying, you know, an Austin 10 or something and suspending a gramophone with elasticated ropes so they could listen to music, you know, whilst driving around <laughs> for the weekend. It's those, those slightly possibly enhanced stories that sowed the seed and, you know, made me um, 
sit up and take notice, I think. Now, why do visions of Mr. Bean come to mind when you talk about a gramophone strapped to a yeah. car? So, uh, yeah, definitely. Well, Rowan there, he, he is a car guy too. So he's had some pretty cool cars as well, but uh, has, yeah. I do enjoy his humor very much. Well, what I want to do now is take a look at some of the roads you've driven down and talk about a big challenge that you faced along the way, maybe your life, career, whatever it may be, but more importantly, what did that situation teach you so you could move forward in a positive light? That's a good question. I mean, I think they've had I've had lots of challenges along the way, but I think I mean going going pretty recently, I think writing this this last book, the um the the mini scrapbook was probably one of the biggest challenges I've had. Not only was it my despite having written for magazines for for years, it was my first book to be published. But it was also given to me, <laughs> delivered by the, the lovely people at Porter Press with a very, very short time scale. Uh-oh. And um, <laughs> I'm not generally somebody to say no, which is how I end up with more work than I should. And I do like a challenge, but this one was, yeah, it was quite major. I mean, to do a whole book from, from scratch in four months and wow. make, it, make it count was, was pretty – it was pretty backbreaking. It was it was stressful for not just me, but <laughs> but my suffering family as well. But but importantly, it was so crucial to me that it it was a thing of quality still at the end. Yeah. So yeah. you know you can do a book or anything like that in quite a short space of time if you're happy to just insert content and insert pictures. But I wanted it to have a similar sort of quality feel of look and read and research make it look like i actually knew what i was doing <laughs> well um, i'll you know, tell that, you martin you that's did quite painful sometimes you know? <laughs> uh, well it means you got to work hard and i'll tell you for those listeners out there it's 175 pages it's what's fun about these scrapbook series that porter press is doing and, and they publish some really fantastic books is this book, as you browse through it is not going to be like something you think it's going to be there is a lot of imagery inserted in here that brings up the whimsy and the fun of the Mini Cooper. A lot of advertisements, a lot of fun pictures, uh, along with a lot of facts and history of the car, all the way up to the competition that the Mini dealt with. So I think you did a fantastic job. Kudos to you. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> but I mean, that's just, you know, one challenge. I mean, I, there have been other challenges over my life. I mean, I think it's teaching yourself that you can do something that maybe previously you didn't think you could, you know, building an engine for the first time, you know, that's always a, a real challenge that, you know, you not only have to go overcome the, uh, the the technicalities of doing something like that for the first time, but also uh, the confidence, the lack of confidence, you know, the self-doubt. So those are, those are you know, similar sort of challenges that you, you overcome. You know, I follow a lot of people on Facebook. A lot of people follow me because of what I do. And just this morning, someone posted, so what are you going to do this week that you've never done before? That was their their statement, which I, I love posts like that versus some of the crazy stuff that you see online these days that <laughs> yeah. makes you want to just run away and turn the whole thing off. And I thought, what a great question. And number one, it's a question. Number two, it makes you think. And a lot of people were responding to it with some really interesting things. Some are kind of silly and stupid, actually, but... Uh, Many of them were, you know what, you've inspired me. I'm going to try something different, do something new. And yeah, we all should do that every day if you can, but at least every week is a small part. But I, I think you did a really great job. I'll be posting on uh, the show notes page for Martin here on the Car Show website how you can get your hands on a copy of this book. It's really, really a fun book. And I know uh, one of my longtime supporters and sponsors, uh, Chris Kimball is smiling right now because he has a Mini Cooper. I was sharing that with Martin that he's very tall, but he still fits inside that little car. He's going to want to get a copy of this as well. So I'll let his wife know. Maybe uh, she can get him one for his birthday or for Christmas. I think that'd be a, a great thing. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, well, let's have a little bit of fun and talk about your first really special vehicle because I know you've had some really cool cars in your stable. Uh, but talk about the first one that was really special for you and maybe share a memory you have about that ride. Yeah, I mean, I think I uh, have owned a pretty wide range and a number of vehicles. I think, although it's a bit stereotypical, I think the first, your first, I don't know, real purchase, the one that you set out to go and buy is always quite special. And for me, that would have to be my Morris Minor or my Morris Traveller. It was a Woody. That's more about, I suppose, fulfilling that, that dream at that point and, and what we did with it then. I mean, bear in mind that I used it through the, 
the last year of art college through meeting my future wife and drove away from from our wedding reception in it and things like that you know how so, cool is that so that's that's got you know that had a, a lot of memories um, attached to it so i think that's always quite special yeah now the morris traveler that had kind of a wood frame on the back like you mentioned it was a woody right so it had that's that right, wood yeah. trim yeah now did yours have where the trim areas were covered with wood or did you see through the paint on the car there yeah, you had the ash frame, and then right. in, infilled within that were, were metal panels. Okay, because I've seen a few where people actually put wood in there. Mm, well, that's, that's yeah, I've not seen one of those over here. But um, Okay. Well, actually, you know, thinking about it, I think that the, the Morris Oxford had a woody version, which was okay. more along those lines okay. um, that had some panels on some variants. Of, but, uh, you know, people did change them up to... To what they uh, what they fancy to <laughs> change more into uh, an American station wagon type thing. You know? Well, see, I grew up in Southern California where they had lots of real woody, so probably that's where I've seen them. Somebody turned it into a, a SoCal surf wagon, yeah. if you will. So I love it. Well, I know you've had a lot of cars, as I mentioned, but you've probably sold a lot of cars. Is there one in particular you really wish you hadn't let go? I was going to say no. <laughs> um, <laughs> now simple, I've stirred something up, yeah, I, I well, believe. No, not that I've kept them all, but because <laughs> I can't afford to do that. But um, but no, I, I every single car that that we've we bought and then sold for whatever reason has given way to another vehicle, another different vehicle, another you know adventure, and it's opened up different opportunities. So there's nothing that I really regret selling. I you know if I hadn't have sold the Morris Minor, I wouldn't have bought an MGB. If I hadn't have sold the MGB, I wouldn't have bought the Porsche. If I hadn't sold the Porsche, then I wouldn't have got into Land Rovers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, yeah, the only one I think I'd, I was lucky enough to buy, it was an absolute restoration project, but it was a, an, an AC Buckland, which was a, a big 15 and a half foot long uh, open top four seater, which was based on the AC two litre saloon. And they only made about 60 of them. And this one came to me, as I say, in need of total restoration. And we knew very little of the history, but as I started to delve into it, I eventually found out it was the first um, AC to ever compete at Goodwood Motor Circuit here in the UK. Oh my gosh! Which is really, a, which is a fairly big deal. Yeah. Um, and it turned out that in the hands of the first couple of owners, it um, raced in period at uh, not only Goodwood but Brands Hatch and Silverstone, so iconic, um, you know, circuits here in the UK. That was a 1953 car, and it, I suppose it competed into the early 60s. That one was one which I, I think I regret not being able to find the funds, time, and in some ways motivation to to actually get it back on the road myself. But it is it is now back on the road and competing here in the UK, so it's it's not all lost. You know, I did save it in some way. Yeah. Now that's a a car that I don't know I've ever even seen one in person. It has a two liter motor, right? Yeah, it's got a, a two liter straight six with a, an alloy block with um, steel wet liners and white metal bearings on the bottom end. So this, this particular one had been sat with the cylinder head removed for about 30 years oh my in, gosh. A, in a damp garage. So I remember having to effectively beat the pistons out of the block with a, a large hammer and a scaffolding tube. Oh <laughs> so fairly barbaric. The price of the engine rebuild alone prohibited me from sort of really taking that project any further. But yeah, it's 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 a it's a rarity and actually not that usable. And if you look it up, it's not actually that not actually that beautiful. It's a little bit like an ugly XK one twenty or something well, like that. But um, you know, I was going to say that, but I didn't want to offend anyone. But now no. that you've opened that door, <laughs> yes, uh, when you look at the front of it, it does look like an odd Jaguar. But then things get a little yeah. unique as they go back. But <laughs> yeah. that car is interesting because it was built on a conventional steel chassis, but it was aluminum panel body on a wood frame. That's right, so yeah. very much built in um, the late 40s to the mid 60s, uh, 50s rather. So yeah, not very many built, 1200 something, I believe. So uh, yeah, very unique car indeed. Wow. Yeah, I don't think I've very, ever known yeah. anyone who's even had one of those. No, there are actually a couple in the in the states. Um, there's a chap. I forget which area he's in, but his, I think, father or grandfather actually worked 
at the uh, the Buckland Body Works where they bodied these these particular examples. And at the time, there was a certain um, chap there working who on the bodies for them, which is Don uh, John Tajero, who um, was also oh. pretty pivotal. You know, when we got to the AC Cobras and what have you yeah. off the world. Um, so it was bodied by ultimately a caravan manufacturer. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. Very unique car. Very cool. Well, thanks for sharing that. Everybody listening now is Googling that AC yeah. <laughs> and trying to figure out what are they talking about? At least those of us over here, I'm sure more people in uh, the UK probably understand or remember that car. Well, I would love for you to talk a little bit more about this book. Again, it's by Porter Press. It's titled Mini Scrapbooks, 60 Years of the British Icon. And being this is a celebration of 60 years of the mini, it's appropriate that this book came out when it did, probably why they gave you such a short time That's frame right, yeah. to produce it. So. Tell our listeners a little bit more about what they could expect to enjoy about this book. I know I'll give you a couple of hints here. There's 436 photographs and illustrations. So there's a lot to see, which makes it fun. 276 uh, package, or, or I should say package pages. And I, I believe as I'm looking at the book, though, it says uh, there's 175. So I'm not sure where that number came from. But my book has 175 pages. But t- tell our listeners a lot more about what you found exciting about this project and uh, why they should get their hands on this book, which I think they should add it to their library. Well, I mean, from my point of view, I mean, this, the Scrapbook series, as you mentioned earlier, has been around for for a little while now. They've done all sorts on, you know, different vehicles and non-motoring subjects, but they are a really good, fun publication of, you know, dipping in and out of. That's That's the key thing with these. Um, they are supposed to be absolutely packed full, which makes it a bit of a challenge when you're trying to put one together. Because obviously what you don't want to do is just trot out imagery which is widely available, especially in an anniversary year. There are no shortage of, of mini-based books, and you don't want to be using all the same images as, as the others. So there's a lot of research for that. So I think we've succeeded in in really delving down into lots of archive material, just trying to encompass the whole the whole of the mini's life, really, and uh, including the modern mini and, and that the fact that that's still still going and shortly to come with an electronic or electric version. We just wanted to make it fun. We wanted to make it absolutely packed. Fortunately, having my wife has owned a couple of minis over the years, so we we do tend to collect books and models and everything. So the first the first thing I did was to open up the the model cabinet here and look at the bookshelves and and draw from our own our own reference library. Really, very cool, uh, very cool. But, but hopefully, it's a it's a fun publication that people can just dip in and out of without feeling like an any under any obligation to read from cover to cover. Yeah, that's the way I looked at it. It is fun to thumb through and then go back, read some areas. I just got back from spending a week up in uh, British Columbia, Victoria, to be exact. And it was really interesting. The Airbnb that we got had parking down below and sitting right next to our parking spot was an old Mini Cooper. And I was down there taking pictures and the gentleman who owned it walked up, he goes, may I help you? Like, why are you taking pictures of my car? And I told him who I was and how much I love cars. And he got real excited and he goes, well, I'll have to go for a ride later. So uh, yeah, they just bring a smile to everybody's face. So the Mini Cooper. So again, Mini Scrapbook, 60 Years of the British uh, Icon uh, by Porter Press. I'll make sure I put links to this book on Martin's show notes page. Martin, up next is the last lap before we put the pedal to the metal. Let's say thank you to today's Cars Yeah sponsors. What's the worst thing for your car's interior? No, it's not that milkshake the kids spilled in the back seat. It's the sun. Harmful UV rays cook your automobile's interior hour after hour when it's parked outside, even on a cloudy day. What's the solution? Covercraft sunscreens. They protect your dash, seats, and interior finishes from those damaging UV rays while keeping the interior temperature tolerable, even on the hottest summer days. No more painfully sizzling seats and steering wheels for you. They unfold quickly and easily install, stay where you put them, and are custom pattern for an exact fit. The foam core acts as a cooling insulator, and you can get yours in different colors and finishes. And they even fold up easily and store under your seat or on the floor. I've used Covercraft sunscreens for years, and they are a fast and easy solution that protect my beloved cars when they're not in the garage. Learn more and order yours at Covercraft.com. 
Want to protect your entire vehicle? Get a car cover from Covercraft. They have those too. That's Covercraft.com. And tell them Mark sent you. Are you looking for a way to get your products or services into the ears of thousands of automotive enthusiasts around the globe? I can help. This is Mark Green here at Cars Yeah, and I'd be honored to be an influencer and ambassador for your brand in a unique and personal way. Five days a week, thousands of subscribers and listeners enjoy the Cars Yeah podcast and website. Contact me today and I'll show you how at mark at carsyeah.com or connect with me through the Cars Yeah website at carsyeah.com. Hey, Mark Green here from Cars Yeah. Did you know you can now see me on the Cars Yeah TV show? It's a weekly visit to some of my past Cars Yeah podcast guests, and I take you along for the ride. You go behind the garage door and into their lives, their businesses, and you get to see what makes them successful. With tens of millions of viewers, Cars Yeah TV is making its mark. Cars Yeah TV is available on MAV TV and Lucas Oil Racing TV. You'll find MAV TV on Direct TV. Fubo TV, Fios by Verizon, or you can stream it through Lucas Oil Racing Television online. And they said I only had a face for podcasting. All right, Martin, we are back, and I have a bit of an introspective question for you. If you woke up tomorrow and you were manifested into a vehicle, what would Martin be and why? Oh, crikey. <laughs> Do you know, I think it would have to be a Land Rover. <laughs> well, that's a, cool. A series Why a Land, Land Rover? A series Land Rover. Well, without doing myself a disservice, simple but reliable. <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, maybe, yeah. maybe a newer one, but I <laughs> no, won't go will, there no. either. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's got to be old. <laughs> All right. So you, you've got a few quirks. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah definitely. Okay. Functional, right. just about. I like it. <laughs> Very cool. Well, I think that's a perfect fit for you. Well, we are entering the last lap, and I'm going to fire off a series of questions and ask you to give our listeners some quick blips of that Land Rover throttle. So here we go. What's the best automotive advice you've ever received? Uh, I think we've already touched on the always question, actually. Um, Yeah, I think that's got to be it. Yeah, especially when buying an old car. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Or an old Land Rover. If Would you share one of your personal habits you believe has contributed to your many successes throughout life? I think getting obsessed to an unhealthy level, at least that's what my wife told me. <laughs> yeah, mine's, mine does the same thing. <laughs> so we're in, we're in a good boat together. Don't worry about that. <laughs> now, how about a resource? There are so many wonderful resources for us these days. Is there one in particular you'd like to share? Do you know, there's not one in particular. I think that although they are blighted with politics, I think that owners, clubs and forums are so important. I think that there's a wealth of experience and information on them. So, you know, my advice for a resource would be to just explore the forums that are available to you. And, and, you know, sometimes you have to thin out the good from the bad. But, um, you know, there's a lot of good stuff on there. Always question when you're Mm. on a forum. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, if I could arrange for you to have a drink with anyone in the automotive industry, living or deceased, who would that be? This is going to be an odd one, but I think... I think it's quite commercial. I think it's got to be Steve McQueen, just for oh. coolness. I think he's, oh, okay. you know, yeah. he's, a, he's owned everything that uh, that you can you can think of, everything from Land Rovers, Minis, Triumphs, you know, motorbikes, Jaguars. I think it's worth having a good conversation with him, especially yeah. getting getting an insight into his mechanical knowledge as well. I think that would be that would be more interesting than maybe his his celebrity status. Oh, I think so. Now here's a here's a cool dinner table. How about Steve McQueen, Paul Newman, James Garner, and put all those guys together that and would be good. Uh, sit yeah. down at a nice pub and have, have some <laughs> ales or something. I, I think, I think that could get messy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I probably could, but I think it'd be pretty fun. I tell you, I was just at the Steve McQueen car show. They have it every year in Chino, California, at the Boys Republic. It's a school where they help. Kids that have kind of gone wayward to try to straighten their lives out. Wonderful school. It's a school that Steve McQueen ended up at when he was a teenager, when he was getting into trouble before he became famous. And uh, his son, Chad, has been a guest on my show a couple times now. And I got to interview him at that show for my new Cars Yacht TV show that aired, started airing this year. Uh, we're going to be showing that show in the fall season when season two starts for Cars Yacht TV. But uh, Chad had some really interesting stories to share about his father. So for those listeners and for you, Martin, if you did not listen to that show, you can go back and find Chad's show on the Cars Yeah website and listen to him talking about, in particular with his first one, the year when his dad was filming Le Mans in yeah, France. I, I, yeah. I did actually meet Chad a couple of years ago at Le Mans 
we always go down for the um, the, the classic twenty four hour, oh, and he was nice. there. So it was it was it was good to uh, to meet him and, and have yeah. a chat. Yeah, yeah, must be have been a very interesting childhood growing up with Steve McQueen. Uh, absolutely, yeah. it's your father for sure. Now, aside from your new book, again, the mini scrapbook, is there another book that you'd like to share with our listeners? Yeah, this was quite difficult actually to <laughs> to thin it down to just one, but the one which sticks in my mind is. Um, it's a book called Porsche 356 by Dennis Jenkinson. So Jenks, um, Sterling Moss's sidekick and journalist. And he writes, it's not a, it's not a terribly big book, but he writes about his, uh, I suppose, decade of ownership with a, a Porsche 356 in the way that only Dennis Jenkinson can and stories of almost writing them off on a weekly basis, it, it seems, and uh, just <laughs> driving them to race circuits. It's a, it's a, a light hearted, I suppose extended car review, really. Right. Yeah. But great. It's book. one which which um, which spoke to me. I've got that on my shelf as well. I I think it's out of press, but you can find them in used bookstores and so forth. So uh, yeah, check them out. Fantastic. Well, listeners, you can find all these resources that Martin's been so kind to share on his Cars Yeah show notes page. Just go to carsyeah dot com. Type in Martin Port, and that page will pop right up. All right, Martin, we're up to the checkered flag, and this last question can be a bit of a doozy today. I'm going to buy you. Any cool collector car on the planet. Doesn't matter where it is or who owns it. I'm going to park it in your garage. However, there are some rules to this game that may make it a bit of a challenge. We'll see. It's the only collector car you can have. That's one of the more difficult rules. You have to drive it. No garage queens allowed. That's an easy rule as far as I'm concerned. But here's the kicker. You can't sell it to buy a bunch of other toys with or other cars and things. You've got to keep it. So you need to choose very wisely. So what can I buy you today? That was very simple. Um, a, a GT40, Ford original Ford GT40. Oh, possibly goodness. my favourite car of all time. I've been very fortunate in that I've driven three original examples, um, road and race prepared. And um, the first time I I drove one, everyone else went for lunch, and I I bought sandwiches and I sat in the um, in the driver's seat and, and, and ate my sandwiches there because I I didn't know how long the privilege was going to last. Yeah. Oh my gosh. But I just think it's it's yeah it's one of the best looking cars and obviously has just such huge history. You know, Martin, you're you're like the first guest I've ever had that lunched in a Ford GT40. Oh yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's pretty cool. You know, uh, my one of my previous career jobs was with a company called Griot's Garage, uh, and we used to find really cool cars that we would put on the covers of our catalogs. And I have to admit, many of those cars that we got in there, I would sit in those and eat my lunch very carefully. I never left a crumb or I'd sit and read, take my lunch hour when those cars are sitting out back, just to sit in those cars and think about the history, where they've been and who's driven them. Um, I did get to sit in a couple GT40s. I can't remember if I ate in one, but I did (laughs) sit in those and I got to drive one. So they are fantastic. Now, there are a lot of replicas, of course, but I know you're going to want a real one. So is there a yeah. specific real one that I need to focus in on to get you the right car? Um, no, not really. It just has to to be properly lived in. And my, my pet hate for, for all of the replicas, I don't think there's anything wrong with creating a replica of something that for most people is unobtainable in original form. But I think so many of them are done very badly and they're not aged and they, they haven't got the right switch gear and stuff like that. I don't think there's the right amount of thought. So, no, I'll settle for any original GT40. It just needs to be <laughs> slightly uh, slightly weathered and, and used. Nice, nice. All right. Well, I'll get to work on that for you, my friend. <laughs> oh, that's going to cost me a pretty penny, but that's OK. I have a feeling you will take very good care of that GT40. Well, Martin, <laughs> you've taken me on a great ride today. Really enjoyed getting to meet you. I want to thank you for sharing your new book, a mini scrapbook, 60 Years of a British Icon with me and my listeners. Could you offer us a little parting piece of wisdom or guidance before you rip off into the English countryside <laughs> in that GT40? <laughs> I certainly can, yeah. It's a very simple one. Always make it better than it was, even even if that's not by popular opinion. If you consider that you've changed something, fixed something, and it's better than it was, then you're going in the right direction. Nice. Nicely said, my friend. And what's the best way for our listeners to follow along with you these days? It'll be probably my Instagram account, which is dedicated all to my uh, my very sad Instagram account dedicated to my 1959 <laughs> Land Rover, which is a an ex well, it's a Trans African Expedition a Land Rover. So it's uh, on Instagram. It's at Trans Africa Land Rover. Trans Africa Land Rover. Very cool. I'll make sure I put a link to that on your social notes page so people can follow you on Instagram. Of course, you can get a hold of this book at Porter Press. 
I'll make sure to put a link to their site so you can get your hands on this new book. You're going to want it on your shelves. Or if you've got a friend who loves Mini Coopers, it makes a great gift. I've got a few of those as well, so they may be coming their way. Martin, thanks for being so generous today with your time and expertise and for sharing your many very cool experiences with the Cars Yeah listeners. Until you and I talk again, I'll see you down the road. Thank you. Cheers. You take care of your cars, but who takes care of your investments? Tune-ups aren't just for engines. Updating your financial plan is important, too. Your GPS may take you from A to B, but it won't help you on the road to financial freedom. For that, you need a good co-pilot and a very trusted advisor. Chris Kimball, CFP, is just the man for the job. He'll guide you down that road without driving you crazy. For over 25 years, Chris has helped people just like you and me with their financial planning and investments. With a master's degree in financial services, he is eminently qualified, and he's a car guy too. Learn more at chrisvkimble.com or call 866-ON-A-PLAN. Securities through Money Concepts Capital Corp. Member FINRA SIPC. CK Financial Services is not affiliated with Money Concepts Capital Corp. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah.